For the next example, let's look at the integral of the square root of 1 minus x squared from 0 to 1. Note that I always write my dx after the function that I'm integrating. It's just good form. It's just polite to do so. It's the right notation. First of all, what's the graph of this function? This function is actually the unit circle, or rather the top half of the unit circle. Uh, you can derive that from the Pythagorean theorem. The height has to be the square root of the hypotenuse, which is 1, because it's a circle of radius 1, minus the corresponding x value if you're drawing some triangle. So, in other words, if this width is x, the corresponding height is going to be the square root of 1 minus x squared by the Pythagorean theorem. So that's why this semicircle is the graph of the function square root of 1 minus x squared. Now we're trying to compute the integral from 0 to 1. So that means that we're accumulating all of the area under the graph starting at x equals 0, so that's at the y-axis, and then going out to x equals 1. Where's x equals 1? Well, this is the unit circle, right? So x equals 1 is here at the right-hand side. So it's that uh, teal region right there. That's the a quarter of the unit circle. That's the area that we're trying to compute using this integral. OK, now we're again going to approximate using left and right-hand Riemann sums. That's the name of the game. So let's first use a left-hand Riemann sum. How does that work? So I'll first zoom in on the graph, the part that we care about, from 0 to 1. And then I'm going to subdivide that interval from 0 to 1 into a bunch of different sub-intervals. Let's use four this time. So we're going to approximate using four boxes. So what are these values? That'll be one-fourth, one-half, three-fourths, and one, giving us four different uh, little intervals inside to use for our boxes. Now we're using a left-hand Riemann sum so that means that for each of these intervals, we use the left side of the interval to determine the height of the box. Right? So that first box, its height is given by the value of the function is 0, the left-hand side of the interval. Next box is determined by the value of the function at 1 fourth, and then at 1 half, and then at 3 fourths. So the area of those four boxes is the Riemann sum, the left-hand Riemann sum, with four boxes. I'll write that as L sub 4, L for left, 4 because there's four boxes. And so, as always, it's given by the value of the function at the left end point times the width of the box. That's just the width of the sub-interval. So I'm going to write out the four terms, which give us the four different areas of these four boxes using the left endpoints of those intervals and then multiplying by delta x. So each of these is the height times the width of a box. What's delta x in this case? Well, you can just kind of see that it's 1 fourth. But remember, delta x, it's always given by the total length of the interval, in this case 1, divided by the number of boxes. It's always the formula for delta x. In this case, that gives 1 fourth. So now let's plug into our function and use that value of delta x to determine the area of these four boxes and compute our left-hand Riemann sum. So I'm just going to write out the formula that we get by plugging into the function. Notice that my multiplication by 1 fourth, that's the multiplication by delta x, the width of each box. That happens outside of the square root. Right? It's really important with square roots that that top of the square root doesn't go too far. I don't want to take the square root of that 1 half or anything. That's not what's going on. And the final term is the fourth box. Its left-hand side is over 3 fourths. So we plug in 
3 fourths into our function, and that will give the area of that fourth and final box. So that's a formula for the sum of the area of these four boxes. If you plug that into a calculator, you'll end up getting 0 0.87393. Okay, next let's approximate using the right-hand Riemann sum with four boxes. To compute the right-hand Riemann sum, we need to consider the rectangles whose heights are given by the right-hand endpoint of the interval. So for each of these intervals, I use the right-hand side to determine the height of the box, like that. And notice that this time a funny thing happens. The right-hand side of the interval is at 1, but the value of the function at 1 is just 0. It's height 0. So this box actually has just height 0. It's not going to contribute any area to our approximation. So we've missed out on a lot of area. There's a lot of error here. That's okay. That's just what's happening for this right-hand Riemann sum. No worries. So again, it's the value of the function at the right-hand side of the subinterval times your delta x. The delta x is going to be the same as it was before. It's going to be 1 fourth. So we're going to plug in these values into our function, multiply by delta x, and then see what we get. So let me write out what that means. Our function is the square root of 1 minus x squared, and our delta x is 1 fourth. So these are the terms that you get when you plug in these values into the function. Again, making sure that the 1 fourth happens outside of the square root symbol. Okay, and notice that this last term I wrote down when we plug in 1 into the function, we have 1 minus 1 squared inside of the square roots. That's just 0, right? So this entire term is 0. That reflects the fact that this final box has area 0, right? So. This calculation corresponds to this geometric fact, which we saw that that height, using the right-hand rule, is just zero, so that has area zero. Now, if you plug this into a calculator, you'll be at 0 0.62393, and so on. So that's our under-approximation using a right-hand Riemann sum with four boxes. Two cups of good hot black coffee, like this. So this process starts to get kind of tedious, writing all of these numbers down, plug them into the calculator. So maybe we can find a formula for LN and RN in general. These are the left-hand and right-hand Riemann sums within boxes. Okay, so using a general just variable name, N, for the number of boxes, what can we say here? This will be true for any function. I'll use the square root of 1 minus x squared in my picture just to illustrate. But this is actually just a general procedure. If we want to use n boxes first for the left-hand Riemann sum, then for each of these sub-intervals, we're using the left-hand endpoint like that to determine the height of the box. And there's going to be n of these boxes, right? So I'm not going to draw them all. The point is there might be like a thousand boxes or a million boxes or something. Many, 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 many boxes in our sum. How do we figure out the area of those boxes in general? Well, if we just kind of label these points along the x-axis as like, you know, a bunch of x sub i's and so on, then what would be the area of this i-th box that has area given by the value at the left endpoint, which would be x sub i here, times your delta x. Okay. So that means that the total area of all of the boxes, your left-hand Riemann sum within boxes, is going to be given by the value of the function at the first x value, I'll call that first x value x naught, times delta x, and then the next one's going to be the value at the next x value. Uh, in, our, in our example just a second ago, that would be you know, 0 and 1 fourth, and so on. 
And now you don't go all the way out to x sub n. It'll be x sub n minus 1 because that's the right end point of that last interval. The left end point will be x sub n minus 1. The subscripts here are counting which x value I'm using. So I'm just telling you the general formula for a left-hand Riemann sum. You can write this in a simpler way without this dot, dot, dot using this sigma notation. It's kind of fun. The sigma notation just says add up all of these expressions where the variable i ranges from 0 to n minus 1. So don't worry if you haven't seen that before or if it's kind of confusing. It's just a compact way of writing this sum where there's a general shape to the sum, a general rule for the sum. So in general, let me tell you how the sigma notation works. If you have a bunch of numbers, a1, a2, a3, and so on, where the subscript is sort of counting them for you, labeling them for you, say it goes up to a sub k, then this sigma notation is just a shorthand for that sum, starting at, say, 1 to k, doesn't matter where you start and end, I'm starting at 1, ending at k, that subscript i is ranging f from the numbers 1 up to the numbers k, and you're adding them all up. This is the Greek letter sigma, capital sigma for sum. So sigma, that's a capital sigma, and it just stands for sum. You're taking a summation, you're adding up all these numbers. So that's a good little bit of notation. And it allows us to write a general formula for the left hand Riemann sum. How would it work for the right hand Riemann sum? For the right hand Riemann sum, on each sub interval, you're using the right endpoint to determine the height of the box, right? So, and again, this will be, you know, let's say x sub i to x sub i plus 1. There's n of the boxes, so I'm not drawing them all. I'm just kind of telling you the general procedure. And then you'll be able to figure out a general formula. Again, we have sort of height zero in this example, but you know, that's very special to this function. So this would be the values starting not at x naught. The first x value here will be x1, because that's the right hand side. But then the last x value will be that final xn, which would be 1 in this case. So this would be the general formula for the right hand Riemann sum. And again, we can use the sigma notation to make it a little bit more compact, easier to write down. Now it'll be a sum where the index, instead of going from 0 to n minus 1, is going to go from 1 to n. That's the only real difference. Or again, delta x, that's the width of your boxes. So that's the right-hand Riemann sum uh, using the sigma notation. Okay, so using those general formulas for the left and right-hand Riemann sum, I uh, used a computer to make a bunch of these calculations. We did the case of n equals four boxes by hand. These were the two numbers we got. This was the under approximation. This was the over approximation to the area under the curve. And if you use eight boxes, you'll get these two numbers. If you use a hundred boxes, you get these two numbers. A thousand boxes, you get these two numbers, and so on. And the point is that as you use more and more and more boxes, notice that these numbers are getting closer together. As you go down the list, these numbers are getting smaller. These numbers are getting bigger. So as n goes to infinity, as you use more and more and more and more boxes, these approximations are getting closer together. And that is how you find the area. It's really an awesome procedure. Uh, approximations get closer to the true area. Fantastic, fantastic method for computing area. This is how uh, computers do it. They're doing these integrals behind the scenes all the time, writing out these huge sums, computing up all the areas of these different boxes. Okay, now in this example, these two numbers, they're starting to get pretty close together. So uh, here's the general principle that makes this work. This is sort of a companion to our abstract uh, formulas for L sub n and R sub n, the um, general formulas for the left and right hand Riemann sum. 
here's the general principle. If you form the limit as the number of boxes goes to infinity of that left-hand Riemann sum, I'll recall the formula here, this is what we found just a second ago, then that limit, it actually gives you the true area. Okay, so this is a general fact for any function, for any integral. Well, assuming that these limits exist, right? And that'll be true on the right-hand side as well. So in other words, when I'm writing down these limits, they're really the values in that table up there as you go farther and farther down the list. So again, this is the limit of the left-hand Riemann sum, the approximations that you form by using the height that's determined by the left endpoint of the subintervals and the right endpoint of the subintervals. If these limits exist and they agree, then they're giving you that true area right here, which is the integral. That's really what the integral is all about. It's about the infinite approximation that you get using an infinite number of boxes, so to speak. What does that mean in practice? That just means that as you go down this list and you use more and more and more boxes, these two values are getting closer together and they're computing the true area for you. So in our example, what does that mean? Well, if you keep on doing this procedure, you'll find that the true area under the curve, remember we're looking at the square root of one minus x squared from zero to one, this is the common value in between uh, the, the two lists of numbers. So scrolling back up one more time, we're looking at a number that's in between these two numbers, okay? And it turns out that it's 0 0.785 dot dot dot. There's more decimals there, I'm not really too concerned. And that might not seem so overwhelming, but remember, what was this function? What, what did we just compute? We just computed the area of that semi-circular region, right? The area of that little bit of the disk, that quarter circle, the area there, by definition of the integral, is exactly this number, 0 0.785. And that actually has something to do with a number that you all know and love. Because if you complete the circle completely, there will be four regions here that all have this area. And this, again, this was the circle of radius one. So notice that the number pi, which is, you know, pi times one squared, if you like, that's four times the area that we just computed, the area of just the teal disk, because if you take four of those teal disks, then together those four copies together give you the area of the entire circle. That's computing pi for you. Well, we just computed that by hand, right? So this would be four times the integral. And so if you multiply this answer that we got, 0 0.785 by four, you'll get about 3.14159 and so on. So in other words, the number pi, this decimal expansion of pi that you've all seen before, where does it come from? You can actually compute it by hand by approximating the area of the circle using boxes, using left and right hand Riemann sums. If you make a computer do this, to like a million, a billion boxes, the answer that it'll pop out will give you this actual value of pi. So cool. I not love music. That's the music he's going to. Come back in style. I stand for